listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again, and today we have another show lineup for y'all today. We have our special guest, Aksana Kukurusa, and she is going to be our special guest. She's going to tell us a little bit about her life story, and also she has a book that you can get the first chapter of. You go to the website, sunflower, sunflowersreallybreak.com. The book is Sunflowers Been But Really Break. First and foremost, I want to welcome to the show, Aksana, excuse me, Aksana, and say how you doing today. Thank you so much, Shamaya, for having me. Um, and I'm, I'm doing very well on a very rainy day in New York City. We're actually having flooding, so I'm, I'm happy I'm staying inside, cozy and warm. Right, yeah. I mean, sure, you should come to Texas because it's apparently going to be hot all year round down here. I, I need you to do an escape. Yeah, as soon <laughs> as it starts snowing here, I'll, I'll be down there. So... Uh, start off with telling us a little bit about your background. You are a daughter of a Ukrainian ref- refugee who survived the Nazi slave camps in World War II. Kind of paint the picture for the audience about your early years. Sure, I would love to do that. So I, I live in New York City now, um, but I was originally born in Rochester, New York, in the early in the early nineteen seventies. Uh, to two, they were actually there was actually two um, survivors of Nazi slave camps, and both of my parents came from the western part of Ukraine, which is now Ukraine. At the time that they were born and they were uh, they were being raised themselves. They were in a part of Ukraine that was part of Poland, the eastern part of Poland. And so um, I am very grateful to them that they were able to make their way to, to, to the United States and I was able to be born a U.S. citizen. However, they had quite a traumatic set of experiences um, getting themselves from from Ukraine to the United States. And it started with the, first it was the invasion of the Soviets into Poland. Um, Both Hitler and Stalin made a deal to partition Poland and the Soviets occupied the part of, of Poland where my where my parents came from. They considered themselves very patriotic Ukrainians, but they were under Polish rule at the time. And the the trauma really started with my mother losing her older brother, whom she was very close to, and he was uh, forcibly conscripted by the Soviet army at the time, and she never heard from him again. And I only have a hypothesis that he may have ended up somewhere in the front lines um, being treated as as cannon fodder, potentially at the border of um, of Finland and the Soviet Union, because at that time, the Finns were uh, allied with the with the Germans, and there was quite a bit of fighting going on in 1940, 1941 along that border. When um, when. Hitler and Germany decided to invade. They um, they they swept through um, that part of Ukraine where both of my parents lived, and initially the Ukrainians welcomed them because they were so fearful of the Soviets. And, and there's a lot of bad history there, and they um, there was a lot of propaganda in their villages about these wonderful jobs if people came to Germany. And it was very early um, in the war and in the occupation, and so both of them ended up being duped to come to come to Nazi Germany and they were told that they would be given these six month visas and they would be paid well and when they showed up they had their papers taken away and they were put into these basically slave labor camps uh, where they spent the rest of the war. My, my mother was in an internment camp that didn't look much different than the concentration camps or death camps um, like we see on TV with like Auschwitz and Birkenau. My father had a little bit of a better experience. He, um, he worked on a farm. So I have this 
hypotheses, and I'm trying to get more information, that he might have been on a um, starvation death march himself towards the end of the war. So they had very traumatic experiences during the war. You know, even my mother talks about in her camp towards the end of the war, um, the the Allied bombings that were happening every night. And she, um, you know, she was able to escape death when her barracks was bombed because she just had a premonition that she needed to get out of there. And she took as many women as she could with her. Both of them were liberated by Americans. And by the way, Shamai, many of your audience may not know this, but 12 million people um, from Eastern Europe were taken by the Nazis, either through propaganda or forcibly kidnapped to work in these slave labor camps with very little food, no money, and they were treated like second-class citizens, basically Hitler and the Nazis believed that the Slavs were were best for slave labor. So they were kind of only one, I guess I would say, strong up the ladder um, from, you know, let's say, you know, the Jews and others that were um, were exterminated. So a lot of people don't know, you know, just the massive numbers of people that were brought over. And my guess is from what I've read is over 2 million people were of um, ethnic Ukrainian origin that were um, forced into these slave labor camps. Those who were um, liberated by the allies, um, many of them were forced to go back to the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe and the Iron Curtain because the allies had made this deal that they would um, you know, that they would send their people home, their citizens home. Uh, however, the Americans were were a little bit better about this. And both of my parents were fortunate that they were able to declare refugee status and allowed to stay in Western Germany. And they spent um, then years uh, in Western Germany. They met and married and they started having children and they were stuck in these displacement Uh, refugee camps and called displaced persons. And so they were living a little bit better than they did in in the camps um, during the war, but they were still stuck in these camps. And there was still a lot of discrimination happening in Germany. And my, my mother was having, you know, quite a few children. She just happened to be very fertile. And so finally they were able to uh, find a way to, to immigrate and find a sponsor in the United States and settled in Rochester, New York. And so that legacy very much lives with me. And, and I've had a very fruitful life. I graduated from college. I um, became a, a public accountant. I even traveled to Ukraine in the mid-1990s to work for a year and a half. And then after grad school, became a consultant. I worked for a large company called Accenture, live in New York City. And I've had a you know very, very good professional career my whole life. But when this latest invasion happened um, in February of 2022, it just really made me wake up and I felt so helpless about what was happening and realized that and saw all over the news that the same things that happened to my parents during her third time in the war and even after the war as refugees we're on the television, my television screen every single night, you know, or in my news feed, you know, whether it was, you know, the Russians using minorities and the Russian Federation as cannon fodder and the front lines through conscript, you know, forced conscription again, you know, if it's the the infiltration camps that I had been hearing about um, Russians forcing Ukrainians through these filtration camps and testing their loyalty to Russia or the 6 million refugees in Western Europe right now uh, that are, that are Ukrainians, you know, fleeing what's happening in their country. And I felt like I needed to write a book about this and get the word out and become much more of an advocate. I had already been protesting and giving money, but this book is really about shining a light to anyone you know, who, will, who will listen to me or, or read my words about how we keep repeating history. And I feel like we as global citizens, not just Americans, but all over the world, really need to come together and, and fight this kind of autocracy and aggression, or it's just going to keep happening. You know, we're just going to keep repeating history. And, and, and that's why I'm writing this book. Most of the proceeds I want to go to 
to go to charity. I've, I've started a foundation already. And um, not only have I been writing the book, but I've been doing podcasts to get the word, word out, as well as I've started to blog on the blogging platform called Medium to be able to, again, just spread the word about what's happening and what we can do to help. I mean, I'm even going down to DC next month to uh, petition my own legislatures about ensuring that they continue to support Ukraine, both financially and militarily. This is on Refocus Radio talking to our guest today, Oksana Kuko Rusa. And being uh, a daughter of Ukraine refugees who survived the Nazi slave camps during World War II, did you find your parents having conversations about what they've been through or was it more of a, you know, it not, was going, a not, going, not going It was detail. a pull, Shemaya. Mm-hmm. The, they faced so much trauma. I, I can't even imagine the kind of trauma that they faced. And they, they're very much like... Ukrainians. I want to <laughs> describe a little bit about the the symbolic meaning of sunflowers bend but rarely break. Sunflowers are the the national symbol of the country of Ukraine, and sunflowers um, are also the also make sunflower oil, and it's the um, it's the the largest export for Ukraine. So it not only is it a beautiful flower, it feeds the nation. And the symbolism of sunflowers bending but rarely breaking is it's really about how sunflowers are flexible and malleable enough to bend towards the sun, even, even when the days are dark. And they're a hardy flower, they're a resilient flower, they're a very stubborn flower. And these are all the ways that you can can describe Ukrainians. They're also very resilient and and self-reliant. And my parents were very much like that. They never asked for help. They always did things on their own and and found a way and they never complained, you know, and they, and they kept things to themselves. So they didn't like to talk about the war. It was really only later in their lives that I was able to get bits and pieces out of them, um, mostly from my mother and then, you know, so for this book, what I've, what I've had to do, because they have since passed away since they were, um, you know, since they were young people during World War II, is I've had to rely on my own memory, um, the memories of my siblings to just glean, you know, some of the most critical pieces to be able to fit into and put into the book and then do a lot of research on my own about what the displaced person camps were like or what the coal mines in Belgium were like. My father worked there after the war or what these you know, slave camps, you know, look like and what life was like there to really kind of enrich the book um, since they didn't tell me everything and they're not alive to data to, to really help me with the book. But to your, that was sort of a long answer to your question of they didn't tell us a lot and we really had to, I, what I do, what I did hear firsthand from them, I, I really had to pull out of them. So when they, when, they, uh, when you were in, New York with your parents. What was it like uh, growing up? What were some of the things that uh, y'all did as a family? And how close were you with your parents as you were growing up? This is interesting. I had an interesting upbringing because I was the youngest of 12 siblings. So I'd mentioned earlier that my mother was, was very fertile. And so she had 12 children. My parents had me very late in life. And so my sibling closest to me in age is about eight years older, my my older sister, Julie. So when I was growing up, I always talk about how I had not just one mother, but seven mothers. And in fact, I would say my parents, when I was really young, they were already quite tired. They had raised a lot of children. And I'm not sure that they realized how hard it would be, you know, in their fifties to raise a little toddler running around. And so my older sis- sisters really pitched in, especially my oldest sister, Jackie. And so I always talk about how I've really, I was really raised by seven mothers, not one mother. 
And so when I was younger, I wasn't that close to my parents. I was much more close to my siblings who really looked after me and, and, and took good care of me and, and helped me and protected me. And as I was growing older and realizing, you know, surmise some of the, some of the experiences that my parents had in the past. And I think what really helped me was spending some time in Europe and, and really understanding my European part of me, my European culture, my European identity, and living in Ukraine. I really tried to become much closer with my parents and spend more time with them and help them and just sit and talk with them. And so as a young adult, I spent a lot of time when I could going back home to Rochester and, and just chatting with them and, and, and finding out more about them and, and how they thought and trying to be, you know, as close and good of a daughter as I could. Once again, listen to Ivory Focus Radio, talking to Oksana Kukorusa. And when it comes to your current time today, how do you balance roles of writing this book and also your your day job and the demand of what you do day in, day out? That's a very good question. And I don't have a lot of spare time these days, to be frank. So I really have three jobs. So one is I'm a mom. I decided to have a child of my own late in life. And I have a beautiful daughter. Sophia is almost three years old. So she takes quite a bit of my time. I do have a demanding job with a consulting firm. So that takes up quite a bit of my time. And, and then there's you know, writing the book and, and blogging and doing podcasts. And so I spend a lot of my nights and weekends uh, working on the book, working on the blogs and book proposals and, and things like that. And the day is focused, you know, very much on, on my work. And, you know, I just have to find some time on the, the weekends and the evenings to, you know, to balance in the, the mother Sophia time as well. With your personal connection to the current conflict that's going on with U Ukraine, for people who don't quite understand the weight of the issue, what's a good way for people to start understanding what's at stake? Sure. The way that I would describe it is the Russian Federation is the last great colonial power on this earth. And Russia has, has not only for hundreds of years colonized Ukraine, but tried to bend Ukraine to its will and make Ukrainians Russian, make them think that they're Russian by minimizing their language, um, outlawing their language, um, trivi trivializing um, the Ukrainian culture, um, stealing, stealing some Ukrainian history along the way. And I, I also read an interesting article recently from a Russian who lives in Ukraine you know, also mentioning, which I didn't even know this, that many Russians blame Ukraine for the dissolution of the USSR in 1991 because they decided to become independent. So I think there's a lot of pent up animosity from Russia and Russians of how could Ukraine want to be independent and not be a part of Mother Russia anymore. And I, I definitely believe Vladimir Putin believes that. So I believe first and foremost, this conflict is about Russia wanting to keep its colonies that it has already in the Russian Federation, because there are many minority regions within Russia and wanting to reconstitute and bring back its former colonies that it no longer has to feel like it's a powerful country, still a powerful country in the world to be reckoned with. And the Ukrainians have gone it alone for 30 plus years. And while there were some similarities with their culture because of the time that they were part of the Russian Empire and 
all part of the USSR. They've had 30 years to diverge, you know, quite a bit in terms of their national identities and their cultural values. Ukraine has been not only an independent country, but has been a democracy for over 30 years. Now there's corruption there. You know, I I won't argue with that. And a lot of that corruption stems from the the government and the politics of the, and the economy of the former Soviet Union and how it was run. But it's still a democracy. They have elections. They've had six presidents. You know, we look over at Russia and Russia's taken a very different path, a path back to the autocracy of the you know, Russian Empire and of the USSR. And they've had two presidents, basically, since I'm not going to count Medvedev because he was just kind of keeping the seat warm, warm for Putin. So they basically had two presidents in the 30 years. And I really do believe that Russia sees, and Vladimir Putin in particular, sees Ukraine as a threat because they're a thriving democracy next door. And the Russian people may wake up one day and realize what Ukraine has, especially as Ukraine wants to ally itself to the West. It wants to become a part of the European Union. And we know countries get richer when they become part of the the European Union. And I don't think Vladimir Putin can see that kind of threat right next door to him. And I believe that those are the reasons that he invaded and why this conflict exists, because Ukraine wants something different. You said earlier in the show that you're going to be visiting D.C. soon. What do you think is the most important message that they must listen to? They need to understand that they, I believe we as Americans owe this to Ukraine. Um, Because Ukraine had a few times to become an independent nation after World War II, after World War, sorry, after World War I, then after World War II. And then we had a time period in, in 1994 when the U.S., the U.K. and and Russia signed this agreement called the Budapest Memorandum, where they said that they would respect Ukraine's borders from 1991 if they gave up their nuclear weapons. And then Ukraine trusted the U.K., the U.S., and Russia not to invade them and to to respect their borders, and that's not happening. And so we in the United States, if any of our allies are ever to trust us again, we need to be held to our word, and we need to support Ukraine to retrieve its borders again. And then secondly, I would say that any investment that we're giving to Ukraine has been used in very beneficial ways, not only for Ukraine, but in the United, the interests of the United States, because the Ukrainians with their blood, sweat, and toil are the Rus- Russians' military capability, which will have, which would basically take off the map, the map, you know, a key enemy of, of the United States government, at least. And and that's what I would tell the legislatures down in, down in D.C. We're talking to our guest, Oksana Kukorusa. When it comes to peace, what do you think, if you had to take a moment and reflect on it, what, what do you think would be important in order for peace to be on the table? Well, peace can take on many forms. I think in my ideal world, peace would be Russia would realize its error and this isn't a war worth fighting and withdraw all of its troops from Ukraine and recognize the borders of Ukraine, you know, back as they were in 1991. I don't believe that they will, that will happen with the current government and Russia. And so I 
believe that we need some sort of regime change in Russia to someone who doesn't care if Ukraine is a nation on its own and next door to them and maybe starts to focus more internally on how the Russian economy can be improved, how the Russian government can be improved, how the Russian institutions can be improved to help their own people and not worry about what's happening everywhere else in the world and interfering. Once again, but talk- that's the ideal world of peace for me. Once again, listen to Army Focus Radio, talking to our guest, Oksana Kukorusa, and you go to her website and get uh, the first chapter of her book, uh, Sunflowers Bend, but don't, excuse me, Sunflowers Bend, but rarely break. The website is sunflowersrarelybreak.com. Last question for you is, this is important to you. If you had a message to the current administration or future uh, administrations in the United States, what do you hope that they will do when it's all said and done when it comes to supporting Ukraine? That's a very good question. My message to them would be that they need to continue to support Ukraine, both financially and with military aid. They need to give Ukraine the air support, not just the F-16s, but the air support that Ukraine needs to not only defend its country from those bombs, like the bombs my mother experienced during World War II that are still raining down on them every day, but to also give them the air support to advance this offensive that they have because they can't do what they need to do without that air support. Secondly, I would ask the United States, the West, to agree for Ukraine to become a NATO member and not just to protect Ukraine, but I believe over the past year and a half that Ukraine has proven itself to be a strong country, not only from the will of the people, but also from what their military has been able to accomplish on the ground, and they would make a strong ally for NATO itself. You spoke to earlier how Ukraine people are strong. If you could say something to them now, what would you tell them? If I could tell them anything, I would tell them not to compromise not to give in to Vladimir Putin, not to give in to his blackmail or to Russia's blackmail and hold the course. And it will be up to us and the West to continue to help them until they can win this war. And then we also need to help them with reconstruction. So I would just tell them to hang in there. We've been talking to Oksana Kukorusa. You can go to her website, sunflowersrarelybreak.com. You can go there and download the first chapter of the of the book, Sunflowers Bend, but rarely break. Once again, I want to say, Oksana, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me, Shamaya. I appreciate it.